All right, thanks for coming. We're going to talk about proximal humerus fractures today. So this is the first case, 85-year-old uh, man uh, with a slip and fall, and um, here is his injury. So Ed, what are your thoughts? 85-year-old woman, I'm sorry. All right, all right. You're you're high maintenance. You're high maintenance, but here you go. Here's an AP. And here's a lateral. AP lateral. Real case came through last week. 85 year old woman lives by herself. Very alert oriented. Community ambulator. She goes to bingo and she's active in her church. Center of the office. Center of the office. What do you do in the office? What are your thoughts about the fracture? Because Megan's like, what is that? Okay, so immediately you say non-operative treatments, but something went through that little brain of yours to make you think that. What made what made you go through your brain? Uh, position of the bones. So the bones are reasonably lined up, right? Very minimal displacement. Okay. Right. Comminuted, not comminuted? Not. Not too comminuted. Although there is there are several fragments here. Uh, not to worry about. Okay. And the tuberosities, are they involved, you think? No. Okay. This is probably the greater trope, right? But it's it's not minimally displaced. Right. And the lateral view, it's a, it's a little bit uh, retroverted, isn't it? Yeah, but she also probably has a giant rosary cuff here, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's been there for 20 years. Okay. So, so, what, so all these things, like things going through your mind, and Megan's like, you know, what made him think all that? There are different parts of the shoulder, and if you can break it down, there's four general parts. There's the head the humeral head part, and that part has a, has a limited blood supply. There's the two, the two tuberosities, greater and lesser tuberosities. On the greater one uh, is the rotator cuff. On the lesser, the subscapularis. And then there's the uh, shaft portion of the humerus. And on the shaft, the lat, the latissimus dorsi, and the pectoralis major um, uh, go to that, and that's what pulls it apart. The blood supply comes mostly from the anterior cir circumflex artery and goes up the arcuate artery. But in most fractures, this is torn. Almost all fractures, I think this is torn. And we're going to get over that. And probably the reason why some die and some don't is from the posterior circumflex. So how much of the humeral head is from the anterior cir circumflex? Uh, everything that's not shaded is anterior circumflex. So most of the humeral head comes normally from the anterior humeral circumflex. So here are the x-rays that Ed wants. Here's the... Um, That's what I yell at them to get. Grashy view? Well, how, do you, how do you ask for it? I want a true AP. You say so true AP? I say, I say grashy view. Yeah, I say grashy view. That makes them open the book up and see what it is. Fine, but if I just say true AP, I want to see the glenohumeral space. I, I know what you're... So they have to go perpendicular to the plane of the scapula. Yeah, I know, so it's, it's like 30 degrees off. But if I, I, this is my point, is that you got to get the thing done somehow. And how is this person going to figure it out? You don't know who that person is. There's always different people. So I always say grassy view. And they have to look it up in a book. Okay. I mean, uh, You should be able to look up in true AP as well, but that's what I want. That's what you want. And the, sure. and the scapular Y view. And here's in the eight, true AP. the time, the, the emergency room doctor will not get good x-rays, have no clue what they have, and they get a CT. They don't even look at the x-ray. They look they at the radio. They look at the report. They don't even look at the x-ray. So here's the, you can see the greater troke and the lesser troke's right here. And you can see the glenohumeral joint real well. And on the axillary view, you can see the lesser tuberosity. I meant to say tuberosity. This lesser. isn't very comfortable to get. Axillary view? They don't get this in the ER, but you, an orthopedic surgeon, you have to hold this to get it because the patient has a lot of pain. So on the axillary view, you can see the lesser tuberosity, and what's most important is you can see if the glenohumeral humeral joint's located. But like I said, the CAT scan, you can see the fragments, you can see the articular surface, and you can see exactly how displaced the tuberosities are. How often do you get CAT scans, and why do you get CAT scans, Ed? So who is non-operative uh, proximal humerus fracture? Well, most proximal humerus fractures are non-operative, 80%. But some of them are displaced and then need surgery. 
So what makes you decide for surgery? Whether well, it's the fracture pad pattern, whether the head's going to be viable or not, the bone quality, what implants you have, and patient age and comorbidities. Hey, good morning, good morning. Dr. Bill, Dr. Denkar, Dr. Doug. Um, we're just going over uh, proximal humerus fractures. Um, so just to review uh, quickly the x-rays, there's the, anato uh, the anatomical neck, which is basically, I think, the cartilage, where the cartilage stops, uh, the humeral head, and then there's a the surgical neck, which is basically, by definition, a surgical neck is where, the, just below the tuberosity is where the humeral metaphysis starts to go into diaphysis. And this is where the joint capsule is mostly. So those are kind of the two most important anatomical structures on x-rays. And the other, um, the other just important thing is the rotator interval where the biceps tendon runs. And the two most important, the, the important uh, deforming factors are the, like Ed said, he's always thinking rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is on the greater tuberosity than the subscap. And you can see how large the pec major is. And the latissimus dorsi there, there on the uh, shaft. And these are all deforming forces. The, the other important thing to remember is the brachial plexus is, is closely associated with the shoulder. And also the axillary nerve goes posterior to the humeral shaft. Um, and when you manipulate these shoulders in drop, you can cause a brachial plexus uh, palsy. So Codman was the first person to break it down into fragments. And there's basically four pieces. The two tuberosities, greater and lesser, humeral head, and the humeral shaft. Okay, and also all this, this lecture came from the Orthopedic Trauma Association. So, now this, this is, the, uh, I know everybody read this whole article, especially Doug, because uh, he really gets on my case when I don't send articles and then he never reads them. But this is from Hertel's um, article in 2004 on head viability. And the way he broke it down is these are um, Legos. Bill, did your children play with Legos? Yeah. So these are Legos. And this, art, this uh, study was done in Switzerland. So he used Legos. And, and this Lego is the humeral head. This Lego is the greater tuberosity. This is the lesser. And this is the shaft. And you can see all the different variations of fractures. And they, and they can use Legos to understand the different types of fractures you could have by using Legos. It, it, I mean, it's a little bit of a joke. but you understand the concept that there's all sorts of different variations. And this is the article, but basically he took a, this person took 100 heads, 100 humeral head fractures, uh, proximal humerus fractures, and he studied them by drilling a hole in the humeral head and seeing if there's backflow. So in the intraop, he took a 2.5 millimeter drill bit and drilled into the humeral head and see if there's bleeding. If he couldn't see bleeding, he had a Doppler that he stuck in there, and if he heard the swish sound, <laughs> He knew the humeral head had blood flow. So he, he checked which humeral heads had blood flow and which did not, and what predicted that to help. So these are the questions um, for every case, is, and they're binary questions, yes or no. Is there a fracture between the tuberosity and the head? Is there a fracture between the tuberosity and the shaft? Is that, so you can understand basically describing the pattern. And, the pro, and this person who wanted to see if the people um, you know, are at risk for AVN. So if you don't have blood supply to the humeral head, it can get AVN. And then the other question is, is humeral head AVN a big deal? What, what do you think, uh, uh, Bill? Is humeral head AVN a big deal, or you don't care? Or can you live with it? Can you throw baseballs? An isolated defect, probably not. You get collapse of the whole head. Uh, you just have, uh, so, yeah, it's a big deal. So pain and stiffness of the shoulder, and the shoulder doesn't work well. Okay, and this study found, they studied all the humeral heads, and they said, what did they find? They found that like, displacement of the fragments was really not that important, and whether it was dislocated was not that important. What was important was if this medial hinge was off. So in other words, if the humeral head was lateral and the medial shaft was medial, that was a very predictive factor. And the other one is whether there was um, a metaphyseal extension to the head. So if the head had metaphysis to it, it's more likely to live. And the reasoning was the humeral heads that live are the ones that have an intact posterior circumflex artery. So the, the working hypothesis is when you fracture humerus, everybody loses the anterior humeral circumflex artery, which is usually what gives you blood supply. 
but the people who had an intact posterior circumflex still had blood supply. So it's predicted by these two things. You would think in the one on the top right that it wouldn't lose the anterior. What's going to compromise it? You know? In that pattern? You see it quite a bit. Uh, right. Well, no, well, the thing is, it's, it's an anterior humerus. Look, every single time I think the, the uh, ascending artery gets torn. Uh, let me show you. Uh, see this thing? This thing probably gets torn every single time in proximal humerus fractures. The arc, what yeah, this is where, I mean, it goes, the blood goes right to the humeral head. So this is where the blood comes from. So that's that's the point is like every, that these people make is that like every single time that's ruptured. And that's what gives almost always all the blood supply in a normal case. But in the heads that survive, they have uh, an intact posterior. So normally it's not the main blood supply. But it, it's what it's what works. I mean, so he, they say every single, almost every single time this gets torn. All right. So this is a case that's torn. So there's no medial hinge. The shaft is medial to the humeral head. And, and this is uh, at risk for AVN of the humeral head. Now, this is a case that should live. Even though it's very comminuted and even though the fracture is displaced, the humeral head will, will, should remain viable because there's 8 millimeters of metaphyseal extension. So it's kind of counterintuitive. And the other important thing with humerus fractures is how thick is the cortex. So. Um, this is another study where they just measured the cortex in, in four areas of the humeral head. And if it's less than four, uh, if it's average less than four millimeters in these two areas, in these four areas, um, there are at high risk for cutout of any kind of implant. So does anybody want to know exactly where they're measured? It's, 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 where, the, it's where the shaft metaphysis becomes diaphysis and then two centimeters below. And you measure the cortex at these four points. And if, if on average it's four millimeters or less, that's not enough to hold screws. That's their point. It's a very high cutout rate. So just look at the cortex, I guess. And then when they fail, these implants usually fail in varus. But now with locking plates, it may, it may not be the case. So this is just a, um, um, a protocol of how to treat these cases. And it, it goes by either if it's a two-part, if it's a three-part, or if it's an anatomical neck. And then, the, um, this is from the HSS protocol, and then they measured the cortex to see how thick it is, what to do. And they also measured how much it was displaced. And they, they, their definition of displacement was two-thirds. If it's displaced by over two-thirds, it changes what they do. So let's do the first one is the two-part. Uh, uh, Non-operative treatment, um, if it's moderately displaced, less than 66%. And they followed these, and, and they felt that non-operative treatment was just as good as uh, surgery. So non-operative treatment has uh, usually good or excellent results, 77%. Um, okay, here's case two. This will be Doug's case. A 58-year-old um, woman, right-hand dominant. Uh, she fell on her arm. Here's the um, x-rays. What do you think, Doug? Can you explain it? What, what's going on? Fragments? What's going on to your head? It looks like she fell. Um, she has Blue Cross Blue Shield, by the way, too. <laughs> she's got a, I made uh, Bill laugh. A greater tuberosity fracture and a surgical neck fracture. Uh huh. And probably a lesser tuberosity fracture, too. So she's sort of got a. This is, this is the lesser tuberosity, right? Yeah. Would you say? So There's one more view, too, before you go on. Here's a, a scapular Y. <coughs> let's do the old. Let's do the criteria we just learned. So is the medial hinge intact? The it is. Does appear to be intact. Is intact. Yeah. So it's not. The head is actually medial to the shaft. And how about metaphyseal involvement? Can you tell? Does not appear. Intact. Yeah, it that doesn't appear. So that's not. That's not a good predictor for her. And also, she's got a fracture. This may be an anatomical neck fracture here, too. 
it's kind of high. Right. But she's all, I mean, it's common. Mm -hmm. So um, what would you do in this case? Do you think it's a high risk or non-op? What, you, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think she uh, would be a consideration for a hemiarthroplasty. Um, I think that um, because of her uh, tuberosity displacement, she's an operative. She's an operative candidate. Um, she appears to have pretty good bone. Um, so Cortex looks pretty thick here, doesn't yeah. it? So what was the final uh, verdict? Non-operative? No, it should be operative. ORIF, the sutures, or hemiarthroplasty? I might, I might try to fix her. ORIF, will anybody do anything differently? Hemi. Hemiarthroplasty? Four-part fracture. Four part fracture. Hemi. So you feel that the, it will, the, the humeral head is, is destined to die? It's falling apart. It's not going to Too common needed to fix? I don't know. I'm just asking. <laughs> <laughs> so the approach is a delta pectoral groove usually. Do you guys use any other approaches? Sometimes I'll use a deltoid split. Deltoid splitting, lateral. To, to, to get to other parts, like to a greater. Greater tuberosity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, Sometimes you have to use both when you can. No, use both? You can. Yeah. You know, that's a four part, but. You know, when they talk about parts, they talk about displacement also. And really, the head is not displaced from the shaft on that. But it's, it's, rotated, it's rotated at least 40 to 60 degrees, so it's absolutely it's, it's, right. it's facing the, the chrome. It's not facing the clinical. It's facing north. Whether to operate or not? Just yeah, treat, I mean, if you treat that non-operatively, I, I would assume that greater tuberosity is uh, it's it, going to, she'll have severe impingement. Okay, in this protocol, if the bones were weak, um, less than four millimeters, uh, they treated it with uh, either heavy suture or um, uh, a locking plate. If the bones were strong in HSS protocol, they did percutaneous pinning. Um, if they were displaced, uh, they did ORF. Uh, if the quality of the bone was uh, poor, and, uh, and it was a, a three-part fracture, um, but minimally displaced, um, they treated it in a sling. So um, if people had poor bone, there was a very high failure rate with standard plates. But apparently locking plates has, have changed that. Have you guys found that to be the case? So, so uh, here's a, uh, looks like a, mostly a two-part fracture, but it's displaced significantly. And they did a, looks like a deltoid, uh, I'm not sure, did a, a locking plate. Um, Hemiorthoplasty in the HSS protocol was for highly displaced fractures, three or four part, poor bone quality, and they felt it was not reconstructable. You couldn't put it together, which is what you guys kind of explained. So uh, very osteoporotic, multiple pieces, very comminuted, um, is better treated with a hemiorthoplasty. But in general, hemiarthroplasty, although the pain relief is good, the, the function, uh, lifting your arm over 90 degrees is very uh, poor. But what do you guys think about that? Is that? you think that statement's true in practice? Yes. These people serving overhead after uh, you fix them? They're good down here. Huh? They're good down here. Pull up. Yeah. Yeah. When you guys start active, uh, active range of motion, like six weeks, or? Six so weeks everything's long. passive, right? Yeah. Uh, until six weeks. Pretty, pretty long time. I actually carry four outcomes. Uh, 
Um, well, usually the bone is so bad that even with you know, good fiber wire suture fixation, if you move them, you can see the, the bone will start to cut out when you're done. Right. Right, let's, do, let's try another case. Case three is, uh, and there's, these are just, uh, I only have x rays, I don't have results, so you just, we just, it's just for stimulation for discussion. Case three, Bill is a 42 year old, the, the male, the fall from 16 feet, and here is his x ray. That's the only film I got. What would you do in this case? Like, let's, let's try to predict if the head's going to. Uh, head so it's a four part fracture, right? So it's medial. So by definition, this may not be viable on the on this, right. and also, but he does have some metaphysis here. Forty-two-year-old guy. guy. I might try a locking plate with this guy. Forty-two is young because it's younger than you, right? That's the definition. So, <laughs> so you would do an RIF locking plate. I might try a locking plate. What else would you do? I mean, if you don't do a locking plate. Hemi, right? There's nothing else. You can't do percutaneous fixation. Okay. So with the HSS uh, protocol, anatomic neck fractures um, have a very high rate of AVN. Unless they're fixed anatomically, it may be a good idea to treat this with a Hemi. And if it's poor bone, a Hemi. So young patients, you know, who, who, what's your, what's your, de Jack? What's your definition of young? <laughs> What? <laughs> right. A age minus five years, right, is young. Your age minus five years is young. So uh, uh, for young people, preservation of functions of primary objective, full core press, anatomic fixation, stable fixation, and only hemiarthroplasty if you, you, you cannot reconstruct it. So for elderly people, who is, which is by definition your age plus five years, it's for bone quality and pain relief is the primary objective. Um, so hemiarthroplasty, um, early motion. So case four will be um, Jack's case. It's a 28-year-old man uh, who was involved in an altercation at Looney's Pub. We won't get into the details of the altercation, but the result is this uh, fracture. So what are your thoughts about this fracture? What would you do? Like, describe the fracture for everybody, and what would you do for it? So he's a little bit at risk, right, by definition? Yep, looks like there's a fracture through the uh, anatomic uh, head, so neck. Two negative predictors. Mm -hmm. but How about medial extension? It's hard to tell. Remember the medial hinge extension? That's pretty minimal. Hard to tell, yeah. So I think you know, this guy has a high rate probability for ABM, but mm -hmm. he's 28 years old. Maybe try to fix this one. So any, would anybody do anything differently? Non-operative? Non-operative. Non so three out of four non-operative? I would do non-operative only because I'm a spine surgeon and I'm not interested in doing shoulder surgeries. Okay, so, so physical therapy. Megan, what's your approach to physical therapy in these cases? Let me, let me ask one question. Bill, uh, when you do a ORAF, what do you write in the prescription? Does physical therapy evaluate and assess, or do you have a protocol? I depends who I'm sending it to. But Me, let's say three, Megan. Uh, Megan. I'll say uh, passive motion. Passive motion for six weeks? Passive motion times four weeks. Okay, passive motion four weeks to Megan, and then go crazy. So, so Megan. I'm going to let him do passive for two weeks and then assisted active for the next two weeks. Because they're doing assisted. So what do you do, Megan? Um, pendulums, usually um, circles. Um, then I think that you would do pulleys, passive both. Pulleys are passive. Mm -hmm. Pulleys are mostly passive. OK. If you can really cue them correctly. I do a lot of just range with them. I don't let them really do a lot on their own. Uh, so you hold the hands. Everything's passive. 
Okay, last case. Um, Ed's a 93-year-old um, man who fell off his tractor and has this um, fracture. What are your thoughts? Get out of horn. Send it to shock trauma? Yes. Okay. So the <laughs> it's a large metaphyseal spike, very comminuted, the whole shaft's involved. Um, but the metaphysis is involved, and there's no uh, the medial hinge is intact too, so the humeral head should live. Um, this shows that it's comminuted. In this case, it was obviously done at a trauma center because it's got this really long locking plate and it spanned the whole fracture. Uh, and as usual, everything heals in these cases. So thanks. So any any questions or comments or thoughts, Doug? Jack, huh? There's no thoughts in here. Okay, that's it. Humoral, uh, proximal humerus fractures. Thanks for coming.